Please stand for the reading of God's word. Today I will be reading from 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12 through 21. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12 through 21. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. All the men of Judah, with their wives and children and little ones, stood there before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jaziel, son of Zechariah. The son of Bezaziah was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem one year. His mother's name was Athaliah and granddaughter of, sorry. All the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. Then the spirit of the Lord came on Jaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Bezaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite and descendant of Asaph. And he stood in the assembly. He said, Listen, King Josephat, Josephat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the path of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of, of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Then some Levites from Kohothetes and Karahatis stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah, people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. As they went out at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. From all that dwell. Amen. From Genesis chapter 7, verse 18, 19, and 20. And the waters prevailed, and they were increased gently upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth and all the high hills, and they were under the whole heaven, were covered. Fifteen cubits toward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. the key and you can't 
It rained for 40 days and 40 nights without stopping And no, I was glad when the rain stopped dropping And when I get to heaven, go put on my shoes Walk around heaven and spread the news To the north, da -da -da, to the south To the east, to the west How it rain just rain How it rain just rain Forty days and forty nights without stopping. I was glad when the rain stopped dropping. And when I get to heaven, go put on my shoes. Walk around heaven and spread the news. To the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. How a rain just rain. How a rain just rain.
thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that lives within each of us. Lord, we ask you to have mercy on mankind all over the world and bless each church door that open in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you this morning because I realize I couldn't even breathe without you, Lord. And when we look back over our lives, we realize that we serve a true and a living God. Lord, we lift up our pastor and Sister Jennifer to you. We ask you to touch him, Heavenly Father, from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. Strengthen him, Lord, where he's weak. Filling him up where he's torn down. Because he's your servant, Lord. And we ask you to touch Sister Jennifer. Not only them, Heavenly Father, remember all the sick. Remember the ones that have lost their dear loved ones. My master and my God, let them know that you don't ever make a mistake. Lord, we're asking you to shine on each person under the sign of my weak voice. Let your Holy Ghost walk through Quinn today. Oh, my master, we need you. We need you more and more. You tell us to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts and lean not unto our own understanding. We serve a mighty God. We serve a good God. We serve a God that knows all about us. And he looked beyond our thoughts and he see our needs. Thank you for Jesus, Mary's baby. Thank you, Lord, because he took it upon himself to bear the sins of the entire world. Lord, I love you. I honor you. And I bless your name. Sometime, Lord, the road get rough. Sometime the going get tough. But I know within my heart that I've been born again. And we must be born again. Lord, have mercy. Bless these children that sing with all their hearts. Bless the directors of them. Lord, I thank you for these ministers. Lead them and guide them, O oh Heavenly Father. Because it's not about me or them. It's about serving you, Lord. And I just praise you. I'm asking you to give us that love that run from heart to heart and breath to breath. Be with the choirs and the musicians. And Heavenly Father, I'll always praise you. I don't know nothing else but to praise you. Study your word. Visit the sick. Even pray for my enemies. Lord, have mercy. Bless families all over the world, including mine. And I'll always give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. And your darling son, Jesus the Christ. And I say amen.
But holding on to faith we know best Nothing can catch you by surprise You've got this figured out And you're watching us now When it looks as if we can't win You wrap us in your arms and step in And everything we need you supply You've got this in control And now we know that you You made a way of you and nothing we've done to deserve the love and mercy you've shown you got the time oh, and you you made a way when our backs were against the wall and it looks as if it were How many of you God has made a way for? Sometimes we don't know how, but we do know why, because he loves us. There, there's one thing that I failed to, to state during the announcements, and that was acknowledging the, uh, the flowers today 
are provided, the altar flowers are provided in loving memory of Sister Marcia Led Freed by the Freed family. So, so we just thank God for, for her life and legacy and we thank God for them. I uh, thank God for his mercy and his grace and his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, for the Holy Spirit, our comforter, counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, and stand by. Thank God for our pastor, Pastor Wright, Sister Jennifer, and for the, the ministers, officers, and members of this church. It's, uh, the scripture was read extremely well this morning. And I just commend all of our young people, but I like the way the brother, he was reading, and that phone probably slipped a little bit. But he had the courage to go in and say, hey, hold up. And he got back on it and then finished it. For me, that takes courage to do that. So I just thank God for, for him and for them. Would you please turn to, to 2 Chronicles, the, the 20th chapter, the first verse. 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter, and the, the first verse is where we'll, we'll look today. 2 Chronicles, 20th chapter, and we'll look at the first verse. We'll look at the first verse. Look at the first verse. We're going to look at how God made a way. And if we can understand how he made a way for Jehoshaphat, we'll understand how he has and will make ways for us. 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter, and the first verse reads as follows. It says, after this, the armies of Moab, Ammonites, of the Moabs, Ammonites, and some of the Midianites declared war on Jehoshaphat. Messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army from Edom, Edom is marching against you from beyond the Dead Sea. They are already at Hazarzan Tamar. You see, Jehoshaphat was the king of Judah. At that time, Israel had been divided into two, two nations or two countries. One was Israel, the other 11 tribes, and then there was Judah, and he was the king over Judah. But he got some news. He got some news that there was a battle coming his way. He was facing a, a great battle. Young people, you, you sung the song, He Made a Way, but got a question for you. Are you in a battle? Any young people in a battle? I saw a couple of hands kind of go up a little bit. Are you in a battle? You know, do you feel like in that battle you can't win because you're outnumbered? You know, young people, you know, one of the things that was always interesting for me with school, there were two times I had a lot of, I won't say anxiety, but concerns about school. It was when school first started and was when school ended. You know, I, I asked one, per, one young, young lady before service, how much longer do you have in school? And she said, 26 days. She didn't hesitate. <laughs> she didn't hesitate. I mean, that just 26 days. So I said, who's counting? Obviously, she was. But you know, one of the things that there was always anticipation about was sometimes people would make threats against me all year, but then they would always look and say, hey, the last day is coming. <laughs> OK. What they were telling me was, get ready for a battle. So young people, when I asked, are you in a battle, are there bullies in your lives, people that are pushing you around? giving you a hard time, I saw a couple of more hands go up from the young people. Young people are pretty sly. You've got to observe them because they'll give you a sign like that. Okay? So, so one of the things I want to share with you is, young people, if you're facing a challenge that looks overwhelming, something that you can't figure out how to deal with, if you answered yes to any of those questions I asked, guess what? God has a word for you. Today is your day. He's got a word for you. Now, just so we don't leave anybody out, older people, any of you feel like you're in a battle? Any of you feel like you're in a battle? Are some of you facing situations where it just doesn't feel like you can win? Just doesn't feel like you can win? 
Are you facing some habits that you've been trying to get rid of for a long time that you know aren't helping you? But, but they just keep lingering around like a bad cough. Older people, are, are, are any of you facing health issues and or financial issues or, or relationship issues in your marriage with your loved ones? Does it feel like you're in a battle? So here's the good news. If indeed you answered yes to any of those questions, God has a word for you. Here's the thing that God wants to do. I believe God wants to take your battlefield and make it your valley of blessings. Wow. I mean, some of us are just trying to make it through. I believe God wants to take your battlefield and make it your valley of blessings. Let me see if there are any witnesses. Have any of you been in a battle before and been challenged before and God turned that thing around so much that the place that looked like you were going to be defeated, it became one of your greatest victories? Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. So see, that's not a foreign concept. God wants to take your battlefield, young people, and make your battlefield your valley of blessings. Look with me for, for a moment at Second Chronicles, the 20th chapter and the 15th verse. And you know, I'm always, God, Spirit of God just has me sensitive to listen to people. And when the young man read this verse, there was like a stirring in the congregation. The 15th verse says, and he said, hearken ye all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed, by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. He said, Don't worry about them, for the battle is not yours, but God's. God wants you to know that the battles that you're facing are not yours, they're his. That should be good news to somebody. Because if I had to deal with what's dealing with me, I don't have the ability. But God wants you to know that the battle that you're facing is not yours, it's his. Now, I'm led to ask you to repeat this with me, and, and let me tell you why. Because I asked God, why do, you, why do you ask me to tell people, ask people to repeat something? He gave me three reasons. He said, by repeating the subject of the sermon, it draws their attention to what he wants to tell you. So when you repeat the title of the sermon, it starts to shut down all these other doors and files, you know, like on your phone when it starts to get slow and the battery goes down quickly, you need to close some apps. What God's saying is he wants you to shut down some apps so you focus on what he has to tell you. That's why I'm going to ask you to repeat this with me. The other thing he said was when they repeat the title of the sermon, it gives them encouragement, comfort, and it's, it's, it's an exhortation. It encourages them to act on it. Then the last thing he said was when we repeat the title, it gives them a nugget or a phrase or a statement that they can hold on to and use when needed. How many of you ever ask somebody, you know, how was church today? And they say, it was good. Say, so, well, what did the preacher preach about? I don't know. <laughs> but it was good. So by at least repeating the title, you've at least got what God wants you to hear. So say this, please. The battle is not yours but the Lord's. We're going to say it a little bit different. The battle is not yours, but God's. The battle is not yours, but God's. Now there were a number of people that said they were in a battle, so why don't you encourage somebody else? Look them in the eye and tell them the battle is not yours, but God's. Tell them again, the battle is not yours, but God's. You know, I'm from Louisiana, and we put emphasis on everything. 
you know, Richard can become Richard. Okay? So I'm going to ask you to tell him like you really mean it. Put a little emphasis in it. Say, the battle is not yours, but the Lord's. Well, I think you said it like you meant it then. You know, God's given me direction to, to preach on the battle is not yours, but the Lord's. One of the things that I, I'd like for us to at least understand is everybody is in a battle. I said everybody's in a battle. You're either coming out, going in, or in. But everybody's in a battle. The question is, whose battle is it? Is it your battle, or is it God's battle? Are you trying to do it based on your might? Are you, are you doing it not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord? Because everybody's in a battle. Now, one of the things that was interesting in this scripture, Jehoshaphat was faced with a battle, an insurmountable battle. He was faced with a battle that he knew he was not going to be victorious by himself. And I really believe if we can understand and kind of dissect what Jehoshaphat did, I believe it'll help us in our battle. You know, I heard a sing early, standing on the promises of God. The key to, to being successful in the battle and making the battle God's and not yours is being able to stand on God's promises. So, so there were three things that Jehoshaphat did. The first thing to make the battle God's and not his or the first thing you've got to do to make the battle God's and not yours, you must have a blood covenant with God, and you must honor that covenant. I said you must have a blood covenant with God, young people, and then you've got to honor that covenant. You see, Jehoshaphat had a blood covenant with God, and he honored that covenant. Now, if you look at that second verse, it's always interesting. Well, look at the first verse in 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter in the first verse. The first two words are after this. You see that? If you're looking at King James, that's what it says. It says after this. What I want to encourage you to do is whenever you're reading in the Bible and you see something like therefore, go look, read and see what was there for. What came before that? So when you look at this, it says after this, then what that says is it's important for us to understand what was before this. What was before this was over in, in 2 Chronicles, the 17th chapter, the third verse, it says this. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the first ways of his father David he did not seek the bells or idol of false gods. See, David was a covenant man. He had a covenant with God. He walked in the Abrahamic covenant. So David, being a blood covenant man or king, Jehoshaphat followed in the, force, in the footsteps of David. So he had a covenant. The other thing is Jehoshaphat honored the covenant. Second Chronicles, the 19th chapter and the third verse says this. So Second Chronicles 19 and 3 says this concerning Jehoshaphat. But there are good things found in you. This is what God was saying to him. There are good things found in you. For you have destroyed the ashram out of the land, so those were idol statues to idol gods, and have set your heart to seek God with all your soul's desire. So one of the things that Jehoshaphat did was he destroyed the idol gods, but then he set his heart to seek God with all of his soul. You remember what the Bible says? David was a man after God's own heart. David was hunting for the heart of God. He was searching diligently for the heart of God. He was a God heart seeker. See, 
when you're seeking God's heart, then you don't have time for all that other junk. Because you're occupied, you're on a mission. David was striving to win God's heart. Young people, be a God heart seeker. Go after God's heart. Because he loves you. Now, one of the things about Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat also understood, he wasn't perfect just like David wasn't perfect. Jehoshaphat understood what it was like when he didn't honor or seek God's direction and will. Because he went into a battle with Jehoshaphat. I'm sorry, he went into a battle with Ahab. Ahab talked him into fighting against his country, but then Ahab set him up. Young people, you ever had any friends that set you up? They'll tell you one thing that looks like it's going to be okay, and then right in the middle of that thing, they flip on you. I see something. Yeah, okay. They, see, young people don't say amen. They just kind of like, you know, what, what, what happened was Ahab got him to go in this battle with him. And then what he told Jehoshaphat, Ahab said, look, why don't you dress up in your kingly robe? And then I'm going to go incognito. I'm going to put on a disguise. I'm going to dress as a common soldier. They went in the battle and the enemy had told all their people, don't go after the great, don't go after the small, only go after the king of Israel. Only go after Ahab. Ahab wasn't dressed like Ahab was in his royal robe. Jehoshaphat was, did. So guess who all the army went after? Jehoshaphat. When Jehoshaphat saw they were coming after him, he cried out. And the Lord had mercy on him, even though it wasn't God's battle, the Lord had mercy on him. And the people turned away from him, and ultimately Ahab was killed by an arrow that was just shot in the air by chance, supposedly by chance. So Jehoshaphat knew what it meant to not honor his covenant with God. In order to really go in and flow and make, you, make the battle God's, and not yours, you've got to honor. You've got to have a blood covenant and honor it. So young people, one of the things about blood covenant, we're talking about blood covenant, but in order to have a blood covenant, what you do is make Jesus the Lord of your life. You make Jesus the Lord of your life. As Reverend Minnie prayed, you must be born again. You confess Romans 10, chapter 9 and 10. Now, for everybody, if you haven't made Jesus the Lord of your life, you have decided to be an enemy with God. God still loves you, but you made a choice to be at odds or an enemy with him. So why would you even say that? Here's what James, the fourth chapter, and the last part of that verse says. If you want to be friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. So that's in James, the fourth chapter, and the, fourth, the latter part of the fourth verse. So in order for the battle to be God's and not yours, first of all, you've got to have a blood covenant, and then you've got to honor that covenant. You know, Ephesians 2 and 12 says, In those days you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from the citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises of God that God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. That's why it's so important for us to pray for everybody. To pray for people that haven't made Jesus the Lord of their lives. Those that are lost. Because they're living without God in this world and they have no hope. That's why it's important to pray. You know, the prayer that you do before somebody passes will be effectual and have an impact. Praying for them after they're dead doesn't work. We've got to really take a stand for others. And you know, the young people sung that song. They sung a song that says, you and I. Did y'all hear that song? Who's going to go talk to people that don't know the Lord? You and I. Who are going to take care of the sick? You and I. Who are going to go see those that are alone? You and I. That's the great commission we've been called to. So the first thing that has to happen in order 
For us to make the battle God's and not ours, we've got to have a blood covenant with God. And then based on that blood covenant, we've got to honor it. We've got to honor that covenant in obe by being obedient to God. The second thing to make the battle God's and not ours We've got to seek and expect God's guidance. We've got to seek and expect God's guidance. We've got to seek, look for it diligently, and expect God's guidance. You know, issues in my life, sometimes I think I can do it on my own. So young people, I know some of you are concerned about the tests that you've got coming up. Some of you are concerned about those tests. Let me share a little confession with you. You know, my first year in graduate school, I flunked out. You know, I went to class, you know, take, I took more hours than I should, and I wasn't doing what I needed to do. I got a letter in the mail, young people, that said, thank you very much for attending Louisiana State University and being a part of our master's in petroleum engineering program, but don't come. Young people, I was in a battle, but I was trying to fight it by myself. I was in a battle in, in graduate school, but I didn't see God's guidance. But when the report of the enemy came, I started seeking God. I started seeking God. For those of you that are unemployed, I got laid off by Exxon. Me, the brightest and the sharpest. They told me, bye. I'm sharing this just with you, just to make it real, because we're all going through battles. We're all going through battles. We don't want to talk about them, but we're all going through battles. But you know, one of the things, look at that third verse in 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter. Notice what happens in the third verse. It says, Jehoshaphat was terrified by this by news. news. I can just hear somebody say, you call yourself a Christian. Here's the reality. Young people, when you first hear things and see things, it's natural for you to be afraid. It's natural that fear will try to grip your heart. That's a natural thing. The question is, how long will it take you to recover from that? I know some, some older people that when fear seizes their heart, when they hear the battle is coming, they get so caught up in fear and worry till they never recover. Matter of fact, you can tell. How many of you know people that you, but when you say, how are you, you know you're going to hear about the battle. So if it wasn't disrespectful, you'd almost look at them and say, how's the battle going? So it's natural for you young people to be concerned when you see a bully when you're dealing with stuff. The key, key question is, when are you going to flip that fear over to faith? When are you going to flip that switch? How long is it going to take you to flip that switch? The older you get, the more mature you are in the Lord, you should be able to go from fear to faith much, much quicker. Your recovery time should be much, much quicker. Notice what it says. And beg the Lord for guidance. So Jehoshaphat was terrified, but he flipped a switch. He started begging God for guidance. Lord, tell me how you want me to deal with this. Lord, tell me what you want me to do. He flipped the switch. Young people and, and, other, and older people, I want you to really focus on flipping the switch. When you see the battle coming, flip the switch from fear to faith. Then what Jehoshaphat did was pray. I don't know if you spent time looking at the prayer that Jehoshaphat prayed. 
It was an awesome prayer. It was an awesome prayer. Unfortunately, some of our best praying comes when we are under, pain, under stress. But it was an awesome prayer. You know, Jehoshaphat actually stood in that fifth verse. It talks about, well, really, before we even go there, in the fourth verse, the, the end of the third verse, it said Jehoshaphat commanded everybody to fast in the country. Jehoshaphat was not only looking for God's guidance, but he asked all the people to look for God's guidance, to hear God's guidance. And all the people obeyed. And the last part of that fourth verse says, they all came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. Who do you run to when you're in trouble? What do you turn to when you're in trouble? Do you turn to the Lord? Or do you turn to friends that don't even have it going on? Who are faced with the same problems you're faced with? Who do you turn to? Do you just search the internet? Or do you go talk to the Lord? That fifth verse says, Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judah in front of the new court at the temple of the Lord, and he prayed. And here's the interesting thing. Jehoshaphat started with a prayer of adoration and praise. Now, this is pretty similar to the Lord's model prayer, where it starts with adoration of God. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It was the same model. Young people, when you go to pray, when you're praying to God, always start out with who he is and what he's done. And it's not because God needs to hear that, but it's because when you do that, as God gets bigger, your problem starts to shrink. But he started with adoration and praise. Our Lord, God of our ancestors, you alone are God. You are ruler of all kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand against you. You drove these people out of the land, is what he said. And you gave it to us, the descendants of Abraham, forever. He was bragging about God. He said, your people have settled here and built a temple in your honor. Now what's interesting about that is 2 Chronicles 17 chapter, the 14th verse, is when the temple was dedicated. So he was going back in, in time to talk about all of what God had done and how these people who were under attack had responded to God. Then he moved on to the blood covenant promise. We talked about the impact, the importance of having a blood covenant and honoring it. This is what he said. He said, whenever we face any calamity or trouble, young people, such as war, plague, famine, or bullies, we can come to stand in your presence, talking about standing in the presence of God before this temple. We can cry out to you to save us, and you will hear us and rescue us. He said, you're going to hear us, God, because you made that promise to us. Young people, God has made promises to hear you. And not only will he hear you, he'll rescue you. Now, what's interesting about it is what he was praying was right in line with this. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear them from heaven, I'll forgive them their sins, I'll heal their land. That's the covenant promise he was standing on. Parents, that's why it's so important that your children sing in the choir, that they're part of this worship service, that they go to Sunday school, they also go to Bible study, so that they're learning what they need to learn so that when the battles in their lives do come, they'll have what they need to be successful. They won't have to sit there and worship on the star, but they can stand on the promises of God. He had heard this from his father's father. And now he was standing on the need and making a covenant appeal to his covenant God. Then he moved to crying. 
He moved to crying. See, some of us go to God and we start with crying versus adoration and praise. Now, if you're like Peter and you're about to drown, you don't have time for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You might have, only have time to say, Lord, save me. But that shouldn't be your pattern all the time. He moved on to crying. That's an interesting combination where you mix praise and crying. Praising and crying. Praising and crying. Here's what he said. He said, And now see what the armies of Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir are doing. You would not let our ancestors go in and destroy them. Now look how they're repaying your kindness, God. Wow, that sounds like my older sister who should all, would always go and tell our parents what we did when they were at the gate while we were trying to straighten it up. You know, the young people say he ratted them out to God. He ratted them out to God. This man was praying when he started to cry. He said, Lord, these are the people that you told us to go around and not destroy when we came into the land. Now look how they're treating your people. They're trying to kick us out of our inheritance. Then the last part that he did, as he did that, look at that 11th verse. Now see how they reward us. Then he asked that question in the 12th verse. He said, oh, our God, won't you stop them? Can't you get the picture of a child going to a, a parent, a mother or a father, and saying, look what they're doing to me? Won't you stop them? Do you get the essence of that? Do you get, do you get how he was appealing to God's heart based on God's promises? Look at what they're doing to us. Won't you help us? And then he ended, he also said, we are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. And he ended by trusting that he was going to hear guidance or word from God. He said, we do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. One translation says, Lord, our eyes are on you. Lord, our, 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 our eyes are on you. You're the only hope we have. We're looking to you, God. We can't do this by ourselves. We're looking to you, God. I believe when that brother stopped praying, there was a stir in heaven. I believe when he stopped praying, God started dispatching angels to intercede on his behalf. Because what made the battle God's and not his was the fact that he opened the door for God to come in and get involved. Some of us are too proud to open the door for God. We just say, I got this. Some of us complain about it, but we don't go talk to God about it. Some of us talk about how bad it is, but we don't find what God promises says, which is the answer. You know, we sing the song we used to, Jesus is the answer. But sometimes we don't go looking for the answer. He said, look, God, won't you help us? Our eyes are on you. I'm looking to you, God. I'm not looking at my situation or my circumstances. I'm looking to you, God. Then God shared his guidance through Haziel. That's when Haziel stood up. The Spirit of God came upon him, and he stood up and told him, the battle is not yours, it's the Lord's. The battle's not yours, it's the Lord's. He also told him, do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army. For the battle is not yours, but God's, but then he said something that was very interesting in the 16th verse. He said, march out against them. He told them to march out against their enemies. I got news for you. Your battles will not be won until you face your enemy. Yes. 